morning, everyone, and welcome to our live stream for Sunday, March 22nd, down here in my basement office at home, pre-recording this little introduction to give you some guidelines about how we're gonna be worshiping together over the next several weeks using this online format. First, I wanna thank Sam Hastings, our Director of Communications and Youth Ministry for editing and putting together our live stream each week. It's a lot of work. Make sure you pass on your thanks to Sam. I wanna thank Clint and the Praise Band for coming in earlier this week to record some music for our 9.30 live stream. I wanna thank Lynn and Susan and our choir uh, for recording some great music and previous services that we're using during our 11 o'clock live stream. Music helps us to feel even more connected to one another and it makes us feel as though we're gathered together even though we actually cannot be at this moment. The one thing we can't replicate in our online worship service is the experience of Holy Communion, which is designed to be shared in the physical body of Christ as we gather together around the table. A lot of churches are attempting online communion. I did some research on that and our United Methodist doctrine doesn't really permit us to do online communion. It's designed again for us to be gathered as the body of Christ. And so uh, we're not able to share in Holy Communion during this time. And even if we wanted to do online communion, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to find bread and grape juice at the grocery store anyway. So we're gonna encourage a different practice during these times when we are together online on Sunday morning. It's another ancient form of spiritual meal. Uh, it's not the sacrament, but it's called the love feast. This was practiced in the early church. It was practiced by the Moravians and John Wesley picked up this practice from the Moravians. The early Methodists practiced it during those times when they were not able to gather together or there was not a priest or a Methodist preacher available to, to consecrate the elements. Uh, this was not exactly a substitute, but a, a different way of sharing in the body of Christ uh, around a table. And so the love feast works a little bit like this. You gather together around the table with family or whoever's gathered in your household. You share simple food like uh, bread if you have it or crackers or cheese or something that everyone will enjoy. Maybe some water or, or other kind of juice or milk together around the table, coffee, um, whatever you have that you wanna gather around. And, and after the worship service then to, to go around, share this meal together and to also share acts of praise and prayer and testimony about what God is doing in your midst. This might be a perfect opportunity for you to check in with one another after a week of being isolated. How are you feeling? What's God teaching you? What is God up to in your life in the midst of this? How are you faring during this time of isolation? Give praise to God and pray together for God to do a new thing, even in the midst of all of this coronavirus crisis. Have an opportunity to look one another in the eye and remind one another that you are members of the body of Christ and that we're connected to Christ, that he's present with us, even when we're not able to be together with our church family. I wanna encourage you to, to uh, engage in that love feast over the next several weeks. My prayer is that uh, as Lent progresses and as we get toward Easter, at some point here, we're gonna be able to gather back together and celebrate resurrection and celebrate the sacrament together once again as the body of Christ and the way that it was intended for us to share it. In the meantime, I hope that you will engage our live stream, that you'll share it with others, that you'll take the opportunity to comment and ask questions about the sermon or anything else that's on your mind in the comment section on Facebook Live or to email your comments to us uh, here at the church. We would love to hear from you and know how we can stay connected to you and how we can help you in these days ahead. May God bless you and may you feel blessed by our worship service this morning.
Testament lesson this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 5, or or excuse me, chapter 7, verses 5 through 11. Hear the words of the prophet as God speaks through him. If you truly reform your ways and your actions, if you treat each other justly, if you stop taking advantage of the immigrant, orphan, or widow, if you don't shed the blood of an innocent in this place or go after other gods to your own ruin, only then will I, the Lord, dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave long ago to your ancestors for all time. And yet you trust in lies that will only hurt you. Will you steal and murder? commit adultery and perjury, sacrifice to Baal, and go after other gods that you don't know, and then come and stand before me in this temple that bears my name and say, we are safe, only to keep on doing these detestable things. Do you regard this temple which bears my name as a hiding place for criminals? I can see what's going on here, declares the Lord. And then wherever you are this morning, I invite you to stand as we share in the gospel lesson as it's found in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 26. Now, you might notice this comes after verses 1 through 11, which is about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we normally celebrate on Palm Sunday. We're going to reference that, but we'll come back to that a little bit more on Palm Sunday. We're jumping ahead just a little bit to Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 12. The next day, after leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. From far away, he noticed a fig tree and leaf, so he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, since it wasn't the season for figs. So he said to it, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. His disciples heard this. They came into Jerusalem. After entering the table, he threw out those who were selling and buying there. He pushed over the tables used for currency exchange and the chairs of those who sold doves. He didn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He taught them, hasn't it been written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a hideout for crooks. The chief priests and legal experts heard this and tried to find a way to destroy him. They regarded him as dangerous because the whole city was enthralled in his teaching. When it was evening, Jesus and his disciples went outside the city. Early in the morning, as Jesus and his disciples were walking along, they saw the fig tree withered from the root up. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look how the fig tree you cursed has dried up. Jesus responded to them, Have faith in God. I assure you that whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, It doesn't waver, but believes what is said will really happen. It will happen. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it, and it will be so for you. And whatever you stand up to pray, if you have something against anyone, forgive, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your wrongdoings. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can gather here in your presence this day, even though it's across the miles. And we ask that you would send your spirit upon us so that we might hear your word afresh. And may the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, one of the places in the world that I always find fascinating and has always touched me whenever I visited there is the steps that lead up to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. I've had the chance to be there several times, and it's one of the places in Israel that where you walk, you can say Jesus actually walked on these steps. These steps would take you up into the temple complex, the temple that Herod the Great had built, and uh, it was known to be one of the most magnificent experiences in the lives of of people who would go to visit the temple during those festival times. I know it is for me, and I'm sure it was for these Galilean disciples as they traveled with Jesus and now finally have arrived here in Jerusalem. So imagine their surprise when Jesus does not spend much time looking around with awe at the temple, but instead marches straight into the portico without any warning and starts flipping over the tables of the money changers. To say the least, This was unexpected, at least for them. Jesus, however, knew exactly what he was doing. Now, I've heard this passage mentioned and read in many different contexts. One of the popular interpretations is that Jesus is throwing a hissy fit. 
because there are money changers in the temple in the first place. That there must always be a distinct separation between religion and money. In one church I served uh, during a council meeting, there was a, there was a violent reaction over the idea that we were going to have a, a table outside of the worship space where we'd be selling crafts that were made by third world children. And people came into the meeting and were pounding the table and saying, how dare we sell anything in church? Of course, I also noticed that these were the people who also had to suddenly get up and go to the bathroom whenever the offering took place every Sunday. But nonetheless, money... And religion should never go together in their mind. But here's the thing. No one, not even Jesus, would have attacked the money changers for being there for that reason. The money changers were, in fact, essential to the sacrificial system that drove the temple. They changed the coins to the proper currency. Roman currency, for example, had the image of the emperor on it. Jews could not handle that technically, and so it had, the coin had to be changed over, and then it could be used so that pilgrims coming into the city could purchase animals for sacrifice. See, the idea of selling animals wasn't the problem so much for Jesus as it was that the temple itself had become the problem. Indeed, in many ways, it was the separation of money and religion that triggered this whole action in the first place. Now remember, Jesus doesn't separate things out the way that we do. We think of money and religion should be separate. We think politics and religion should be separate. Jesus doesn't think this way, and neither do most first century people. That's a modern phenomenon, compartmentalizing life into specific parts that should never intersect with one another. Politics, religion, money, free time, privacy, all are separate. You shouldn't mix them all together in polite conversation. In the first century Jewish world, however, and particularly in the mind of Jesus, everything was filtered through the religious worldview. Jesus understood understood that God was and is intimately interested in our politics and in our pocketbooks, as much as he is in our worship. For God, money is always a spiritual issue. To understand that, we have to understand the role of the temple in first century Israel. From my own Sunday school upbringing, I always had the idea that the tabernacle and then the temple were always strictly reserved for religious ceremonies, kind of like church. The temple was the place where God was assumed to dwell, there in the Holy of Holies, the most holy part of the temple. People brought pure animals to sacrifice, to atone for sin, to be reconciled to God. Teaching took place in the temple courts. The priests lived there. I always remember as a kid thinking that my pastor lived at the church. And then I was stunned to find out that he had his own house and that he went to the grocery store and went shopping like everyone else. Some parents of children in our own congregation think that I live here too and they would be partially right about that most weeks. But while the symbol of the temple was Israel's primary focus. I mean, think of this being sort of like uh, the the Grand Cathedral, the Vatican, uh, the Capitol, the White House, all kind of wrapped up together. The high priests were more than just religious leaders in that context. They were also agents of the government, appointed by the king, or by the time of the first century, the Roman emperor. They were usually chosen from among the wealthy aristocracy, which meant that they would be loyal to the government because it was their own pockets that were getting filled. To that end, the temple, like many ancient temples, acted like the national bank. Money flowed into the temple as Jewish males from around the world paid a temple tax for its upkeep and and operation. More importantly, the temple was also the central repository for all the taxes Rome collected. Think about all those tax collectors out there charging, and then all that money would come into the temple where it would be stored. And from there, the tribute would be sent to the emperor, while any excess was assumed to be a bonus paid to the collecting officials. So the neighborhood tax collector was hated because of this, but the truth is that it was the temple authorities and the wealthy who were really making the big bucks. Add to this the fact that the temple also housed all the records of debt. Think of it also like the National Credit Bureau. 
when the Jewish rebels revolted against Rome in the year 66, around the time Mark was likely written, the first thing they did in order to purify the temple was to go inside and burn all the debt records. So much for separating money from religion. The temple was a religious center to be sure, but it also beco had become the center of oppression as the wealthy used debt as leverage to take land away from peasants, subjugating them in a form of economic slavery. So here was the ambiguity of the temple, the symbol of worship on the one hand, the symbol of injustice and national pride on the other. And it's this ambiguity that Jesus attacks through this acted parable of flipping over the, te the, the tables. As we've seen throughout Mark, Jesus draws on images from the prophets and he acts them out symbolically. For example, Palm Sunday itself, the entry into Jerusalem, was a planned political demonstration, an enactment of what the prophet, prophet Zechariah wrote about in Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, the announcement that the rightful and righteous king had arrived, but riding on a donkey and not on a war horse. And so the next day here in the temple, Jesus stages this other act of political and religious protest, one that's even more scandalous than the first, and one that more than any other of all the things Jesus has done to this point, results in his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion later that week. The Old Testament imagery that Jesus draws on comes from two different passages, but each with the same theme. Isaiah 56, 7 describes the temple as a house of prayer for all peoples. That was the temple's intent. And by the time of Jesus, there was a, it was at least that way in theory. Herod the Great had built a court of the Gentiles within the temple complex as a place where even non-Jews could come and bask in the glory of the temple. Though given Herod's reputation, that was likely more about impressing outsiders than necessarily wanting them to worship God. People from all over the world came and at least got close to the temple, one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world. The Jews considered the temple to be the navel of the earth, where God dwelt in their midst, even though they still believed God was everywhere. This was the special place. This is where heaven and earth literally come together. But even during the time of the prophets, the temple had not always maintained its purity around worship. That's where the second part of that quote comes in, from Jeremiah 7, which we read earlier. God ordered the prophet to stand in the gate of the temple and declare to the people that they had subverted the temple's intent. Just because they had a temple didn't mean that God was always going to be there to dwell with them. What would be the criteria for God's dwelling in the temple? It's not just that worship was performed correctly. Look again, chapter 7 of Jeremiah. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. And going down a little bit further, um, uh, he says in verse 11, Has this house, which has been called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. In other words, according to God, worship without justice for the poor and the weak was no worship at all. No matter how religious or righteous you appear to be, no matter what you say you believe, it's how you treat the least of God's people that determines your true colors. Notice, though, that the temple, this house, is called a den of robbers. Now, the robber's den, remember, is not the place where the robbing takes place. It's the hideout. It's the place where robbers gather after they've done all the dirty work. For Jesus, the temple has become such a den. The place that symbolized all the injustice, hypocrisy, and ambitions of the nation. But there's another interesting twist here as well, because the word for robbers in the Greek is leistes. It's the same word that Mark uses to describe the bandits who were crucified on either side of Jesus. Leistes was the word used by the Romans to charge people with sedition and inciting revolution. In the Roman justice system, 
common thieves did not get crucified very often. That was reserved for the most violent revolutionaries who committed insurrection against Rome. Mark was likely writing somewhere after the year 70 when the Romans were besieging and eventually destroyed the temple when it had become one of those strongholds for Jewish rebels. That was sort of the, the Alamo for the rebels. These rebels had seen what the temple was doing under the administration of Rome, and they tried to rebel through violent insurrection under the leadership of a series of self-proclaimed messiahs who turned out to be even more corrupt than the Romans and the temple leadership, by the way. But the temple was their national symbol. In fact, those rebels minted coins with the temple on it, using it kind of like their national flag. This was their last stand. This was the thing that they were willing to die for. And it was until it was burned and collapsed on them all. Mark thus reminds his readers with these two visions of the temple. The temple as a corrupt institution that exploited and oppressed the people, and the temple as the symbol for Israel's violent nationalism and patriotism. And what Jesus will say on Tuesday about the coming destruction of the temple affirms this connection. For Jesus, the temple had gone far astray from being a house of prayer for all the nations. It had become a den of thieves and mercenaries whose ambitions were not the way God and his kingdom were intended. In short, Jesus turning over the tables in the temple was a precursor to judgment. His action was intended to disrupt the work of the temple, even if it only briefly. He had, in effect, shut down the temple by disrupting the system, refusing to let anyone carry anything around for the sacrifices. But that was nothing in comparison to the final shutdown that was coming. God was going to destroy this temple and tear down the systems of oppression, violence, and empty religion it had come to represent. Now, I want you to notice in the text, when we read this section, if you go back to the beginning there at verse 12, Mark, once again, loves to frame stories. And he frames the story about turning over the tables in the temple with a parable Jesus tells about the fig tree. It's actually not more than a parable. He's actually doing something to a fig tree. This tree that they come across on the way to the temple doesn't bear fruit. It's too early for it, so Jesus condemns it. And after, after they come out of the temple, the disciples notice that the tree is dead, as Jesus said it would be. And Jesus says, seems to be cryptic here. If you say to this mountain, now what mountain is he pointing to? Probably the mount of the temple. If you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. In other words, the present order represented by the temple was going to be replaced by God's new order, what Jesus called the kingdom of God. The kingdom would not come through violent revolution, but through a movement of peace, justice, and suffering. Forgiveness not violence, is the weapon of the kingdom. The temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed, but a new one would rise in its place. The temple represented by Jesus himself, who dwells in and through his followers and transforms them as agents of reconciliation, forgiveness, and peace for the whole world. Now, admittedly, that is a lot of stuff to digest. That's a lot of heavy theological content in a few short verses. You might actually want to go back and, and listen to that again at some point. But there's a really sharp lesson for us here, too, if we will learn it. And it's a lesson that I think is especially important for us today in this particular season in which we find ourselves. Our lives have been flipped over, overturned in an unprecedented way in recent weeks by this virus that's been sweeping the world. Now, let me be clear. I don't think this is a plague that God has visited upon us, though God will do what God will do. But I do think that God will use this disruption to overturn a lot of the things that we have relied upon and take it for granted as our security and well-being. Those symbols of our own national values and self-importance, of our economic security, the devaluing of life that we traffic in so cavalierly. I think this is an opportunity for Jesus to get our attention 
as much as he got it from those in the temple in the first century. For example, we've relied on something called the economy to determine our worth, our well-being, the qualifications of our leaders. When the economy is flipped over, what do you have left? The money changers haven't been driven out, but they've been flipped over. Do we rely more on our 401k for security, or do we rely more on God's provision for us? A health crisis flips over and exposes the underbelly of how we value life as well. We live in a world where both the unborn, the chronically sick, and the elderly are seen as expendable. People will kill an unborn child and not worry too much about a disease that only affects the sick and the old, forgetting, of course, that at some point they were an unborn child and one day will be very sick and very old. Jesus judges the ways in which our culture has trivialized human life, embodied life, and calls us to quit worshiping self and to give ourselves away for others, especially for those who are the most vulnerable. We rely on people who may be on the lower end of the salary scale, and yet we have often treated the poor as less than ourselves. Now it's those grocery store clerks, and truck drivers, and delivery people, and nurses, and hospital janitors, and other service workers who are saving us as much as the doctors are. It's a stark reminder of Jesus' constant drumbeat that the least of these are the most important in the kingdom of God. He flips over our assumptions of importance and reminds us that we are all interconnected and we need one another. In the kingdom, there is no us and them, rich and poor, blue collar and white collar. There is only we. We live in a culture that's very much focused on the individual. And when a crisis comes, the focus then becomes every man for himself. We build fortresses of toilet paper. And we empty the shelves so we get ours. And well, if you, if you snooze, you lose. Our greedy, gluttonous mindset is always in a mindset of scarce, scarcity. We never have enough. We've seen how stores have been hit by panicked shop, shoppers like plagues of locusts, not focusing on what they need, but on overstocking at the expense of others. Jesus flips that over. He flips over our individual needs for self-gratification and calls us to be the people who serve, who share, who learn to go without so that others may have what they need. We argue about politics and are more interested in assigning blame to others than we are in evaluating ourselves. Politicians and pundits on all sides, all sides like to use a crisis to score political points. Jesus flips over our reliance on politics and tells us to pay attention to being in the Father's house and to do so with prayer. Now, there are plenty of other tables that Jesus is flipping over among us in these days. Tables that reflect our reliance on anything and everything but Christ and his kingdom. Jesus walks up those steps into the temple and he cleans house. And he will do it with us as well. This is a time when I think he's doing that. And it's important that we take the lesson. Jesus was never afraid to flip over the status quo. People who do that usually encounter a lot of opposition. Jesus knew that his action in the temple would cause a stir, perhaps even resulting in his own death. And yet he did it anyway. This action, more than any other, results in Jesus' crucifixion at the end of the week. Jesus believed he was acting on God's behalf, and indeed he was. Do we believe about the same thing about ourselves as his followers? Are we willing to act on God's behalf to challenge a world where domination is the norm? Are we willing to bring a message of peace and justice and hope, no matter what it might cost us? I really believe that Jesus is inviting us into the kind of robust faith and radical commitment to God that he embodied. Jesus is the world's true king. And he calls us to pledge our allegiance to him and the way of his kingdom. The church's vision can no longer be small, to simply be a nice worshiping community of nice people. But we're seeing that we have to be different we have to learn to adjust and to change and to be out in the world. Now that we're forced to be, I wonder what that will do for us.
our mission has never been to simply reflect the culture around us. The more I pray about this and study the scriptures, the more I see a God who is wanting to push us beyond our boundaries and comfort zones. God is calling us to work for what we pray for. God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we have a tremendous opportunity to be that kind of people right now, to demonstrate a different way of being to a panicked world. We're not playing for the short term, but for eternity. We need to be at the church that reflects the way of the kingdom in our care, in our concern, in our self-sacrifice, in our non-anxious presence, in our love. Do that. And then Jesus can truly say that we are a house of prayer for all God's people. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word even though it challenges us today. And we ask that you would pour your spirit on us so that we might go forth from wherever we're sitting today and reflect your care for your creation. Help us to recognize those places in our own lives that need to be flipped over so that we can be more like you. In the name of Christ, amen. Now we come to the part of our service where we stand and we affirm what we believe as we share together in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our Lord Christ invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live at peace with one another. As we prepare to commune together across the miles and across space, let us pray our prayer of confession. Sometimes, O God, we forget people or we toss them aside. The difficult ones, the needy ones, the ones that are hard to spend time with, the ones who confront us. And sometimes when we do things like that, it's not really about the other people, but about us. We are uncomfortable, or we feel guilty, or we follow brighter, shinier people, or we worry about what will make us look good. We are in such desperate need of your forgiveness. We need to be forgiven for our sin, for our mistakes, for our mistaking what the world values with what you value. Help us to be better and to see more clearly and to care more thoroughly. In Christ we pray. Amen. We come to our time of offering, and I want to remind you that uh, even though our church is scattered, uh, the needs are still great, and so we invite you to continue giving through your tithes and offerings. You can do so on our website at tlumc.org. Simply go to the top right of that page and it will tell you there's a link there for giving uh, online. We also invite you, you can always send a check to the church. We are checking the mailbox, 20256 Hunting Downs Way, Monument, Colorado, 80132. Or if you'd like, you can work with your bank to create an automatic transfer uh, for your giving. We encourage your generosity and we thank you for the great ways in which you continue to support your church.
even when you're not able to be physically present. As the offering is taken, let us pray. Lord, receive these gifts, use them for your glory, that your name might be proclaimed throughout the earth. Amen. Join us as we sing Everlasting God. Now go in peace. Go forth as a people who've been flipped up and exposed, but ready to be the people Jesus calls us to be. May we go forth recognizing that he has dwelt among us, that he is the new temple, and we put our trust and faith in him. Go in peace to love and serve God and neighbor in all that you do. Amen.